welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode 196. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as always, I'm joined by Mr. Mark Pearson Freeland. Good morning, Mark. Hey, good morning, Mike. I hope you uh, are feeling as happy and enthusiastic as I am to be continuing our journey, our series, our season, our adventures into the world of happiness. I am feeling very ready and it's like we have found so many great, inspiring leaders and writers on the theme of happiness. And that theme continues today, albeit with a twist, I might say, Mark. That's right. The twist that that we are delving into today, Mike, is from more of an entrepreneurial or VC angle. That's right. We are digging into the almanac of Naval Ravikant, which uh, was pulled together in a great little guide, a great little collection by Eric Jorgensen. And Mike, this is really a not only a a collection or a consolidation or maybe a Bible of Naval's thinking, but it's, it's really culminated and curated in an insightful way that helps you and I, our listeners, understand a little bit about how Naval, who's this very well-known, impressive VC and entrepreneur individual, uh, tackles his own happiness. I mean, what a what an interesting angle to bring into the series. Yeah, it is a it's a very different take, and that's exactly why we've uh, we've added him uh, at this point in the series. And Mark, I think we should touch base on um, some of the companies that Naval as a as a VC has been involved with. I mean, have, you've got a bit of a list there. I think why don't you hit us with some of the the big names that we're I'm sure everybody will know. I mean, look, uh, Naval, he's uh, an interesting individual. I, I, I don't know, Mike, whether we've got time, similar to sim- reading out all of our Patreon members. <laughs> uh, I need a couple of deep breaths and I need to do some stretching beforehand. But just to give you a little bit of an idea of Naval's uh, in interests and inclusions and investments in a lot of early stage companies include Uber, Foursquare, Twitter, Wish.com, Push, Poshmark, Postmates, Thumbtack, Notion, SnapLogic, Open Door and Clubhouse, Stack Overflow, Bolt, Open DNS, Yammer, Clearview AI. So he's really spreading across a lot of different industries there, but he's also been involved in uh, more than 10 unicorn companies. I mean, Naval has been pretty intrinsic and important in the creation of a lot of the businesses that you and I and our listeners use pretty much every day, particularly Uber and Twitter. And he's kind of like an unsung hero who's behind the scenes working. Oh, sorry. And that's not even to mention AngelList, Mike, (laughs) of course. (laughs) Stop, Mark, I have to stop you. This show will just be reading out because it's over like 200 companies he's invested in, right? Something like that. That's right. Over 200 companies. So if there's an interesting angle that we can bring into the happiness series, bearing in mind, we dug into the work of Dan Harris, with Matthew McConaughey, Tal Ben-Shahar, the Dalai Lama, and more recently, Neil Pasricha. Now digging into the almanac of Naval Ravikant, A Guide to Wealth and Happiness, is a great inclusion, I think, into this space because he's coming at it from, let's say, more of an entrepreneurial Mm. wealth angle. Mm. Absolutely. And the the thing that we can all look forward to breaking down, discussing and learning and understanding today is not just this idea of happiness, but how it relates to our skills, our entrepreneurial endeavors, and hopefully the wealth that we create on the other side of that. And a big part of that is decision-making, learning. And there's a huge amount of not only mindset shifts that you'll get uh, from studying Naval Ravikant, but also some fundamental habits practices that you can do every single day. So Mark, now that we've laid it all out there, let it let us throw the thinking of Naval Ravikant at our listeners and our members. Where should we start? Let's start straight away with Naval breaking down and helping us understand how to create wealth. There's this battle that happens on Twitter a lot between should you work hard and should you not? Like David Hauser's on there saying it's like you're slave driving people. And Keith Roboy is always on there saying like, no, all the great founders work their fingers to the bone. First of all, they're talking about two different things. David is talking about employees in a lifestyle business, which is fine. 
your number one thing in life, if you're doing that, is not getting wealthy. You have a job, you also have your family, you also have your life. But Keith is talking about the Olympics of startups. He's talking about the person going for the gold medal and trying to build a multi-billion dollar public company. That person has to get everything right. They have to have great judgment. They have to pick the right thing to work on. They have to recruit the right team and they have to work crazy hard because they're basically engaged in a competitive sprint. So if getting wealthy is your goal, you are going to have to work as hard as you can. But hard work is absolutely no substitute for who you work with and what you work on. What you work on is probably the most important thing. Finding product market founder fit, which is how well you are personally suited to that business. The combination, that three, that should be your overwhelming goal. And you can save yourself a lot of time if you pick the right area to work in. Picking the right people to work with is the next most important piece. And then third comes how hard you work. But they're like three legs of a stool. If you shortchange on any one of them, the whole stool is going to fall down. So it's not like you can pick one over the other that easily. So the order of operations when you're building a business is, or even building your career, is first figure out what should I be doing? What is something where there is a market that is emerging? There's a product that I can build that I'm excited to work on and something where I have specific knowledge and I'm really into it. And then second, surround yourself with the best people possible. And no matter how high your bar is, raise your bar because you can never be working with other people who are great enough. If there's someone greater out there to work with, you should go work with them. I advise a lot of people who are looking at which startup to join in Silicon Valley. I say basically pick the one that's going to have the best alumni network for you in the future. Look at the PayPal mafia. They work with a bunch of geniuses, so they all got rich. So just try and pick based on the highest intelligence, energy, and integrity people that you can find. And then finally, once you've picked the right thing to work on and the right people to work with, then you work as hard as you can. This is where the mythology gets a little crazy. People work 80, 120 hour weeks. A lot of that's just status signaling. It's showing off. Nobody really works 80 to 120 hours a week sustained at high output with mental clarity. Your brain breaks down. You just won't have good ideas. So really the way people tend to work most effectively, especially in knowledge work, is they sprint as hard as they can while they're working on something and they're inspired and they're passionate and then they rest, they take long breaks. It's more like a lion hunting and much less like a marathon runner running. So you sprint, then you rest, you reassess, and then you try again. And what you end up doing is you end up building a marathon of sprints. Nibby just made the point to me on the side that inspiration is perishable, which is a very good point. When you have your inspiration, do it right then and there. This happens to me a lot with my tweet storms. I've actually come up with a whole bunch of additional tweet storms besides the ones that are already out there. But sometimes I just hesitate or I just pause and then it just dies. And what I've learned is if I'm inspired to write a blog post or to publish a tweet storm, I should probably do it right away. Otherwise, it's not going to get out there. I won't come back to it. So inspiration is a beautiful and powerful thing. And when you have it, just seize it. So people talk about impatience. When do you know to be impatient? When do you know to be patient? My glib tweet on this was impatience with actions and patience with results. And I think that's actually a good philosophy for life. Anything you have to do, just get it done. Why wait? You're not getting any younger. Your life is slipping away. You don't want to spend it waiting in line. You don't want to spend it traveling back and forth. You don't want to spend it doing things that you know ultimately aren't part of your mission. And when you do them, you want to do them as quickly as you can while you do them well with your full attention. But then you just have to give up on the results. You have to be patient with the results because you're dealing with complex systems. You're dealing with lots of people. It takes a long time for markets to adopt products. It takes time for people to get comfortable working with each other. It takes time for great products to emerge as you polish away, polish away, polish away. So impatience with actions, patience with results. And as Nibi said, inspiration is perishable. So when you have inspiration, act on it right then and there. If I have a problem that I discover in one of my businesses that needs to be solved, I basically won't sleep until at least the resolution is in motion. And this is just a personal failing. But if I'm on the board of a company, I'll call the CEO. If I'm running the company, I'll call my reports. If I'm responsible, I'll get on there right then and there and solve it. If I don't solve a problem the moment it happens, or I don't start moving towards solving the moment it happens, I have no peace. I have no rest. I have no happiness until that problem is solved. So solve it as quickly as possible. I literally won't sleep until it's solved. Maybe that's a personal characteristic, but it's, it's worked out well in business. Mark, this got me big time. Impatient with actions, but patient with results. Mm. You know, he, he really is talking about some interesting things here, which I think is 
very much on the mindset shift and we're going to get to all the habits and, and the practices that you can do every single day. But before you kind of jettison yourself into that impatience with actions, but patient with the results, one of the things I think he really encouraged us to do when we start projects, endeavors, maybe businesses and companies is to make sure he's elevating the conversation a little bit. He's like, well, before you just throw yourself at it, make sure you're working on something that's meaningful to you and with people that you like. And I think what you're going to see a lot in this show, Mark, is Naval is always about like, um, take time to think, pause, and consider before you launch yourself. And I think that what we're seeing here in the pursuit of wealth and happiness, what he's really encouraging us to do is to really critically think through with whom are you going to do it? Mm. What are you going to do? And if you are going to do that, have a bias towards action and just be patient because with those things done, good people on an interesting topic with a bias towards action, his hypothesis is the results will come. So I wonder, Mark, have you seen this? Have you had the experience where you've actually kind of been together with the right people on the right thing and just seen those results, been patient with the results or has it been hard? Like, tell me how you kind of relate to this experience. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, um, as I, as I hear from Naval in that opening clip and as I reflect on the happiness series, isn't it interesting how we can connect and see this, um, idea of success through work being so interconnected with your own mindset and interpretation of, of happiness, of patience, of gratitude and so on. So for me, when I've done really difficult projects, yeah, my, my mindset and happiness is so affected by the idea of, um, the, the marathon or, you know, it becoming really, really difficult. And I think what's very consistent with what we've found on the show so far and many, many other individuals that we've covered, Mike, is that bias towards activity being a relief. Mm. If you've got something that, you know, let's say it's, it's the show and let's say the moonshots team, we're all thinking ahead for a great show. Maybe it's one of our master series. Maybe it's today. We don't leave it until the last minute because it's going to be uh, doing a disservice for our listeners as well as causing the three, the, the, the team, you know, this, this big anxiety. Mm. So I think where I'm connected with that, that statement you just read out, the impatient with actions, patient with the results, I I'm connecting it to even what we do on the show. We're impatient towards the bias. We want to get going. Yes. We want to work hard, create something of value. And that's where I'm seeing a lot of similarity. I think where, and what we can learn from Naval is to keep that sustained keep that moving. Mm. And then eventually we, we, we reap the benefits like the lion hunting in the savannah. Well, I, I would put it to you, you know, as you were talking then, I was thinking that it is a lot like uh, great sports teams where they say you have to trust the process. You've got to trust and, the process. Yeah. And the reason that you can trust the process is you've, you've thought through doing good work with good people. I can just like train, play hard, work hard and know that in the end we'll get the results, right? Yeah. So you don't have to worry while you're on this pursuit, be it a project or building a whole new company. If you've got good people around you, you're working on something that matters, just have a bias towards action. And you know what? Don't worry. Will we, or won't we succeed? You can trust the process because you've got those things ticked off. Maybe there's a fourth thing you could add to that, and that would be if you become a member of the Moonshots podcast, <laughs> maybe you can trust the process a little more. So, Mark, I think this is the perfect moment to uh, tip our hats to our lovely, steadfast members who are make this entire show possible, don't they? 
Yeah, that's right. So as tradition dictates, for those who are digging in deep, they're patient with the action. Well, they're impatient with the actions, but patient with the results are our members and Moonshot's family members. So let's please welcome Bob, Niles, John, Terry, Niall, Marjolin, Ken and Dietmar, Marjan and Connor, Rodrigo, Yasmin, Lisa, Sid, Mr. Bonjour and Maria, Paul, Berg, Kalman and David, Joe, Crystal, Evo and Christian, Hurricane Brain, Samuela, Kelly, Barbara, Bob, Andre, and Matthew, Eric and Abby, Hosie and Joshua, Chris and Kobe, Damien, Deborah, Gavin, Lasse, Tracy, and Steve, Craig and Lauren, FBA, <laughs> Daniel, Andrew, Ravi, and Evert. I mean, Mike, this list is it's long isn't it? <laughs> it's long and it's good. And I have to bring to your attention and to our listeners' attention, they probably are all thinking right now that there was no trumpet from you, Mark. Usually oh, yes. you begin roll call with a trumpet. So I, I'm going to let you think about that and uh, <laughs> I will field all the complaint emails. That's okay. Um, but on a serious note, thank you to you, our, our members. Um, you help us cover all of the different bills that we get every single month. You have encouraged us uh, to uh, start our famous moon merch, which I think we might mention in our next show because uh, the elves have been busy and we'll be ready to launch that very soon. Um, But on a serious note, thank you to you, our members. Super grateful. Um, And we really... uh, Really encourage you guys to reach out to us. Avert was uh, actually, he came up with a great uh, topic for us to talk about, which is the second brain. Mm. So I've added that to the uh, future shows list, Mark. So we've got more brain work ahead of us. How does that sound? Yeah, I can't wait to dig into the idea of second brain and linking your thinking. What a great little title. But mm-hmm. for now, Mike, and we'll come back to Avert in, in the future, we're going to go back into the world of Naval. Ravikant. And this next clip we've got is actually from Justin Chuang on YouTube, who's really uh, helpful at breaking down a particular idea from Naval, which focuses on skill and expertise. The specific knowledge is the part that a lot of people get tripped up on. And what it means is basically knowledge that only you can truly understand. And while some might think that it's what you studied in school, it actually is the kind of stuff that you're naturally curious about, you're obsessed about. For some, it might be playing video games. For others, it might be you know, dance or coding or, or working out. Once you arm yourself with that specific knowledge, it's much easier to get paid for that because there isn't a lot of competition. Actually, Naval goes as far as to say, you know, specific knowledge is not just what you're obsessed about, but it's, it's knowledge about who uh, you are as a person. No one can compete with you on being you. I love that phrase because, you know, for, for a long, long time, I was like wondering, oh, who's like my niche audience? And like, what do I talk about on this channel? A lot of great advice just encourages, you know, you to be as authentic as possible. And specific knowledge is really applicable in today's really fast changing world. Naval's in the school of thought that says, you know, it really doesn't matter what you learned in, in college. What matters much more today is to be an expert in a brand new field in the span of 9 to 12 months. And, and that is much more important than um, having studied the right thing um, way back in the day. Skills and expertise. Yeah, I think, you know, this is really uh, challenging me to ask the question of myself. You know, what is the the one skill that I have and am I working on it enough? I, I really can't uh, stress how much I experience this aha mark of the importance of expertise and skill for knowledge workers. And I would mm. assume, uh, like you and I, many of our listeners are, are sort of knowledge workers. Um, and I do really hope we have a few craftsmen. That would be really cool. I do hope that we have some makers who do stuff and build stuff in the physical world. But a lot of us are working on ideas and products and businesses in the digital world or service experiences. And so a big part of that is having a skill and expertise. Um, And I think there is this process that that clip touched upon, which is what is your super skill that you're, you know, you're naturally built to do and are you developing it enough? So Mark, when you hear this conversation 
about skill and expertise. I want to kick it to you. Like what, what are the skills you're working on? What are the expertises that you're building in this very information age or the information revolution in which Mm. we're living in, we're witnessing what skills and expertise are you building for yourself? Well, I hope you're going to let me have this one, Mike. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, because I, c- I could choose a, a physical digital product yep. that I utilize but, or a utility, but I'm actually going to go for attitude. So attitude, because and the reason why I'm going to claim this as a, as a, a more modern day um, learning is the attitude to be able to keep up with and create divisions around the way that I use technology. So when I'm um, at work, uh, or even when you and I are recording our shows, you know, I'll have very, um, intentional activities that I do in order to try and create the best product or the best environment around myself. So whether it's utilizing lessons from Cal Newport with digital minimalism, carving out, do not disturb or focus time, time blocking is very important to me. And that enables me to utilize and use technology and products and and be a better version of myself because I'm less distracted. Likewise, when it comes to thinking about new things or covering new topics or areas on the show, it's focusing on having a growth mindset. So having this uh, desire to want to learn, maybe it's new products, maybe it's new ways of working, maybe it's sprints like Naval said in the first show, in the first clip. And that's where I, I'm kind of actively working on. That's the skill that I'm trying to really build on. Are you going to let me have that one though? <laughs> I think I need more help uh, to understand. <laughs> Are you talking about uh, the skill of time management or focus? Uh, help me understand this a bit more. I think it's really the skill around uh, being open to being flexible. So having flexibility in the way that I manage my time. Okay. So, so you're going back to like the, say the productivity series and looking at how you take ownership of your time, how that resource is deployed. Because I think as we, as we all know, particularly those of us who are knowledge workers, your time is uh, much more highly utilized nowadays. You know, arguably, maybe we're a little bit more efficient, but at the same time, I think there's a lot of work that goes onto your shoulders that you're expected to deliver because you've got um, a computer that's uh, enabled, you've got teams uh, around the world, you can work in any different time zones. I think as we've all experienced, it's it's a little bit of a challenge. And I think having the ability to try and utilize or take ownership of that time Mm -hmm. is, is the skill that I'm working on. What's one breakthrough technique or habit that you have developed in the the battle for your own time? Being honest with people, I think, you know, that's, that's probably, it's obviously putting in the physical time area that we've heard about on the show. So blocking, you know, an hour or two in my calendar so that teams can see it, but also requesting it saying, Hey, I, I'm going to be working uh, on a, some, maybe doing some deep work or focused work in time X to Y. Mm-hmm. Please don't disturb me. This is what I want to do. Taking that ownership, having the confidence, or the ability to to share that with others, I think is something that you know I'm still trying to figure out, still working on. But that's that's definitely something for me that is a big tip, probably from that productivity series we did. That's helped me quite a lot in this modern day. Uh, busy world. Yeah, the look, we're in a battle for our time, and I love what you're saying. You're, you're essentially saying taking a, like it's like carving out that that time slot. Let's say it's nine thirty to eleven. Saying I need that for work. There shall not be an invite going into that time slot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? G- Gandalf is there. He's defending my. You shall my not calendar. pass. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, uh, listen, like. And, and it's really interesting, isn't it? You talk about permission, uh, asking for what you need mm. or saying no. So many of the, the great people that we've studied on this show say the art of success is not only knowing what to say yes to, but invariably it's more often saying no to things 
that don't align with your purpose. Exactly. It is, it is that connection back into the Simon Sinek way of, of thinking about business, uh, understanding what drives you. But I think that's where Naval is really leading us as well, isn't mm. it? Like, you know, mm. particularly in that first, the first couple of clips we've heard, it's Naval taking um, a real stance around understand what you're good at, what you want to work in, gather the team who are perfect for you. And then you work as hard as possible. It's the focus, it's the understanding, it's the knowledge that I think he's really driving us towards, isn't it? Yeah. Look, there's another skill and expertise you can develop. And I believe, Mark, (laughs) it could be as just as powerful as what you're talking about. And that is giving a review or a rating, a thumbs up, a star to our beautiful show, Mark. If we want to get this message uh, of learning out loud together to be the very best version of ourselves. You got to hit like, you got to hit those stars. How do people do this, Mark? Because uh, those moonshotters, we need this love, don't we? Yeah. All those with a growth mindset and a desire to pick up and do something brand new today, as you're listening to the show, open up your podcast app of choice. You're probably even got it open right here, right now, as you're hearing us. Pop along, hit like, hit subscribe, hit the little heart button. And that makes a huge difference in getting the Moonshot Show out into the ears of listeners around the world. And that's really what we're just trying to do here. We're trying to delve into the work of people like Naval Ravikant and share it with the world. And it's you, our listeners, who help us do that. Your likes, your subscriptions, your thumbs ups, and as well as your reviews spread that through the algorithm and get us into the ears of listeners around the world. And we've had a a number of different countries throughout the, uh, the journey so far, Mike. I mean, I remember we've had Suez Canal listeners, we've had, uh, Nepal, we've had all over the globe. And it's thanks to you listeners for us to be able to do that. Yeah. So get on there, thumbs up stars, whatever it takes. You're listening to us right now. Just slip the phone out of your pocket as Mike hypnotizes you. (laughs) Open up the application, five stars. Mike's great. Mark's a little dodgy, but we'll bear with it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I jest, I jest. We, we appreciate any goodwill that you have to give us here on the Moonshot Show. And we've got so much coming up thus far, though. We've talked about skills, expertise. We're talking about how to create wealth. And now we're going to turn to the business end of the season. It's about actions and habits. And we're going to launch ourselves into learning the skills of decision-making. First is if I'm faced with a difficult choice, such as, should I marry this person? Should I take this job? Should I buy this house? Should I move this city? Um, should I go in business with this person? If you cannot decide, the answer is no. And the reason is because modern society is full of options. There are tons and tons of options. We live in a planet of 7 billion people. We are connected to everybody on the internet. Uh, There's hundreds of thousands of careers available to you. There are so many choices. You're biologically not built to realize how many choices there are because we evolved in tribes or tribes of 150 people where if you pass up one choice, the second thing never comes along. Uh, Also, when you choose something, uh, it takes, you get locked in for a long time. If you start a business, that's 10 years. You get into a relationship, that's five years. Uh, maybe more. Uh, you move to a city that's 10, 20 years. So these are very, very long lived decisions. So it's very, very important uh, that you only say yes when you are pretty certain. Uh, you're never going to be absolutely certain, but you're going to be very positive. If you find yourself creating a spreadsheet for a decision with a list of yeses and nos and pros and cons and checks and balances and why, you know, why this is good or why that's bad. Forget it. Yeah. You have to internalize it in your gut and in your heart and you have to really want something before you go for it. So my first decision making heuristic is if you cannot decide, the answer is no. Uh, the second decision making heuristic that I use is if you have two choices to make, uh, such as, uh, you know, do I, tell this person A or do I tell them B or do I, uh, you know, do I take job A or job B? 
Um, or, you know, do I make this sacrifice now or do I go ahead and do what I want, whatever it is. If you have two choices and they're relatively equal choices, like if it looks 50-50 to you, this is key. For choices where it's lopsided, you know, 175, there was 25, obviously go with the 75. But if it looks equal to you, A or B, and you can't decide, take the path that is more difficult and more painful in the short term. Because what's actually going on is one of these paths requires short-term pain and the other one maybe requires pain further out in the future. And what your brain is doing through conflict avoidance is it's trying to push off the short-term pain. Um, and by definition, if the two are even and one has short-term pain, that means it has long-term gain. And by the law of compound interest, the long-term gain is where you want to go towards anyway. So your brain is overvaluing the side that has the short-term happiness uh, and is trying to avoid the one with short-term pain. So you have to cancel that tendency out. And it's a powerful subconscious tendency by leaning into the pain. Um, as most of you know, most of the gains in life come from uh, suffering in the short term so you can get paid in the long term. Working out, like for me, is not fun. I suffer in the short term. I feel that pain. But then in the long term, I'm better off because I have muscles or I'm healthier. And now I'm going to talk about the third heuristic for decision making. The third one is a little different. Uh, the first one was focused on making the right long-term decision. The second one was on uh, choosing how to split between two otherwise even paths. The third one is about cultivating peace of mind. Uh, and peace of mind is, is very important because it is the precursor to happiness. Happiness is one of those things that cannot be chased directly. If you chase happiness directly, what you're actually chasing is pleasure and pleasure eventually comes, uh, with a, uh, with a withdrawal symptom. Like if, if pleasure is a high and then you crash down. Her pleasure is a Ferris wheel that you get on, you ride it up and then eventually you ride it back down. But if you actually want to be happy, if you want to be content, that comes from peace. Um, and so the third decision making heuristic is, if you're having, uh, it, this is very helpful in times of interpersonal conflict, where you're trying to figure out whether to say something to somebody or not, uh, that might make them angry or might get something off your chest. Um, make the choice that will leave you more equanimous. Equanimous is sort of a fancy word for internally calm and, uh, settled. Uh, make the choice that will leave you more equanimous at the, uh, in, in the long term. Mike, I mean, we could have done an entire show just on that one clip. Couldn't I we? would even go into the three different tips Naval gave us for making better decisions and focus on the second one. I think that's the big, oh. hairy, challenging one, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, look, the, the first one, if you can't decide the answers, no. The third one, more peace of mind. You're right. The second one. If two equally difficult paths, choose the one that's more painful in the short term. That's so moonshots, isn't it, Mike? <laughs> it's moonshots, but it's very counterintuitive. Oh. How many times have I found myself, oh, we'll just do that. that that'll be fine. And oh, I, I do it. It's, it's oh. a, almost a daily challenge. Oh, oh gosh. There, there will be times, whether it's choosing whether to go to the gym or having that cold shower or maybe picking up the phone and calling somebody back. Yeah. You know, there's moments where you think, ah, oh, wouldn't it just be nice if I didn't have to deal with this? Yeah. And you try it, you know, I don't know about you, Mike, but in the past I, I've put things off. But actually, interestingly, when you do, when I do catch myself doing that and I realize, oh, I'm just avoiding it because it's simple. Mm. And what I'm doing is building it up so much that eventually I'm going to crack <laughs> by well, not doing it. Okay. So this is a really good point because this is something that I have learned through so many mistakes in deferring tough moments, decisions, hard work in deferring. I'm only making it worse. And mm. the problem is you need to have stuffed up enough times doing this to realize that you can kind of use that suffering and go, I'm going to sort it now because if I don't sort this problem now, it's 10x worse in a week or a month yeah. or a year. But even though you know 
it is wiser to do it now. The short-term pain can still make you reluctant, reticent, uh, avoidant, <laughs> and it, it is um, perhaps one of the most subtle yet profound things we've discovered on the show is that people who have the ability to grab this moment and going, I'm being really soft here. I'm taking the easy path. I'm going to stop and I'm going to take the harder path in the short term because it will pay off in the long term. Mm. This is one of the big patterns we see in people who are very successful, people who are super fulfilled in their life and doing what they are meant to do. Is they are very prepared to take the hard path in the short term, to take the pain uh, as Yoko Willink will say, problems, good. good. As uh, Joe Rogan talks about, get comfortable with discomfort. Mm. Um, what I mean, David Goggins, oh, my gosh, he's the king of this. He's like become uncommon, you know, take, get primal, face uh, hardship and challenge. Do not run away from it because, Mike, I think we all know it's sort of come comes back to bite us, doesn't it? Well, it does. And I think the the build that we can do here and leading us back from the idea of decision-making towards happiness is all of those individuals, Goggins, Yoko, Joe, as well as Naval here, the idea of working on something now in order to make it let's say more uh, pleasurable or less painful even in the long term is by doing it now. And I would make the connection that that satisfaction or relief that comes in the long term is a build on achieving happiness. So by making things quite difficult right now, knowing, oh, I don't really want to have to do this or I'm avoiding that pain, by doing so, I'm going to personally look back at myself and, and feel maybe pride, maybe I'll feel happy or content with the amount of work and consideration that I put into it. And I th that's where the connection back into this mindset is, mm. is coming to me, Mike, because if I can work on myself, get myself comfortable with the discomfort, then I'm going to be maybe that little bit more satisfied and let's say happy in the future, wouldn't you say? Yeah. So I'll give you a little technique I use. So you talk about like, you know, there's like this goodness. There's a good, good thing at the end of the rainbow. There's a destination that will make us happy, satisfied, fulfilled. So what I do, if I need a little extra incentive here, is I allow myself to really experience the future state. If I do X, I'm going to feel really mm -hmm. joyful. And I'm going to think about and, and almost manifest that joy now and say, okay, see how good that is. That is ahead. That is down the path for me. And that is going to give me the capacity to make whatever sacrifice I'm called upon to make right now because I can really immerse myself in that feeling of what the reward will be at the end. So it's a little technique that uh, I've learned uh, a lot through um, mindfulness practices. But if you're like, hmm, oh, I really should be doing this thing, it's going to be a real hassle and a lot of work, then I spend more time imagining and manifesting the goodness of the outcome, the experience, the well-being of the outcome to give me that stuff and I'm going to do it right. I'm ready, mm. you know, because sometimes we're in such a, uh, we're so overwhelmed with the commitment of right now, the painful route, the hard route, that we lose sight of what's in the horizon. We lose sight of, oh, actually, there's a really great thing at the end of this. So it's like a powerful way to remind yourself of what you're fighting for. Anyway, that's just a little technique I use to try and <laughs> take those more pa painful routes in the short term. 
Yeah, that's right. Well, I think uh, talking about advice and tips, we've got another clip now coming up from Naval, who, again, with the idea of connecting us to to happiness and connecting us to feeling satisfied and almost encouraging us to do things that maybe don't come quite so naturally, is a common mistake that people often make specifically around reading. The foundation of learning is reading. I don't know a smart person who doesn't read and read all the time. And the problem is, what do I read? How do I read? Because for most people, it's a struggle. It's a chore. So the most important thing is just to learn how to educate yourself. And the way to educate yourself is to develop a love for reading. So the tweet that is left out, the one that I was hinting at, is read what you love until you love to read. It's that simple. Everybody I know who reads a lot loves to read. And they love to read because they read books that they loved. It's a little bit of a catch-22, but you basically want to start off just reading wherever you are and then keep building up from there until reading becomes a habit. And then eventually you will just get bored of the simple stuff. So you may start off reading fiction, then you might graduate to science fiction, then you may graduate to nonfiction, then you may graduate to science or philosophy or mathematics or whatever it is. But take your natural path and just read the things that interest you until you kind of understand them. And then you'll naturally move to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Now, there is an exception to this, which is where I was hinting with what things you actually do want to learn, which is at some point, there's too much out there to read. And even reading is full of junk. There are actually things you can read, especially early on, that will program your brain a certain way. And then later things that you read, you will decide whether those things are true or false based on the earlier things. So it is important that you read foundational things. And foundational things, I would say, are the original books in a given field that are very scientific in their nature. So, for example, instead of reading a business book, pick up Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations. Instead of reading a book on biology or evolution that's written today, I would pick up Darwin's Origin of the Species. Instead of reading a book on biotech right now that may be very advanced, I would just pick up The Eighth Day of Creation by Watson and Crick. Instead of reading advanced books on what cosmology And what Neil deGrasse Tyson and Stephen Hawking have been saying, you can pick up Richard Feynman's six easy pieces and start with basic physics. If you understand the basics, especially in mathematics and physics and sciences, then you will not be afraid of any book. All of us have that memory of when we're sitting in class and we're learning mathematics and it was all logical and all made sense until at one point the class moved too fast and we fell behind. And then after that, we were left memorizing equations, memorizing concepts without being able to derive them from first principles. And at that moment, we were lost because unless you're a professional mathematician, you're not going to remember those things. All you're going to remember are the techniques, the foundations. So you have to make sure that you're building on a steel frame of understanding because you're putting together a foundation for a skyscraper and you're not just memorizing things because if you're just memorizing things, you're lost. So the foundations are ultra important. And the ultimate, the ultimate is when you walk into a library and you look at it up and down and you don't fear any book. You know that you can take any book off the shelf. You can read it. You can understand it. You can absorb what is true. You can reject what is false. And you have a basis for even working that out that is logical and scientific and not purely just based on opinions. The beauty of the internet is the entire library of Alexandria times 10 is at your fingertips at all times. It's not the means of education or the means of learning are scarce. The means of learning are abundant. It's the desire to learn that's scarce. So you really have to cultivate that desire. And it's not even cultivated. You have to not lose it. Children have a natural curiosity. If you go to a young child who's first learning language, they're pretty much always asking, what's this? What's that? Why is this? Who's that? They're always asking questions. But one of the problems is that schools and our educational system and even our way of raising children replaces curiosity with compliance. And once you replace the curiosity with the compliance, you get an obedient factory worker, but you no longer get a creative thinker. And you need creativity. You need that ability to feed your own brain to learn whatever you want. Reading, reading, reading. It is feeding and fertilizing your brain. It is, uh, oh my gosh, but Mark, the thing that struck me the most about that one is like so many things, reading has to be like working out every day. Isn't it amazing how many different things are on that absolute essential daily habit list from the Moonshots podcast? I mean, what have you got? Let's go through the list. 
well, I, get I, to I, bed I, early, right? Get to bed early. <laughs> get to bed early. Um, cold shower, meditate, stretch, journal, read. I mean, the list is enormous, Mark. Yeah, you're right. Uh, exercise, uh, yes. listen to the Moonshot Show, read and uh, rate and review the Moonshot Show, become a member. I mean, there's so much, <laughs> there's so much to do every day. But you're right. I, I love I, again connecting this this tip, this habit, this way of thinking about reading and how it is the stepping stones to creating um, a growth mindset. But I would say even more important, the confidence that you can, you know, either A, hold conversations that you feel comfortable in. You could go out and be in social situations, whether they're, you know, casual or business orientated. You can, as Naval says, walk into any library and pick up any book. I think that's a real great, a really valuable demonstration and build on what a good growth mindset is, Mike. It's the confidence to, to uh, be yourself and yeah. be comfortable with what you know. Yeah. So. What kind of habits or hacks have you been working on in terms of reading recently? I mean, my go-tos are book summaries. Like I, I think I consume a book summary almost every day. So if someone recommends a book or asks me to think about something or a topic comes up that I'm like, hmm, I need to know more about this, I just type the words book summary and then <laughs> the theme or the person or the expert that's a, that's a go-to uh, way because you can, in five minutes, you can totally get like the gist of an idea and go, okay, I get it. I want to know more, get the book, or I, mm. uh, I know enough and move on to the next thing. What are you doing to like tweak your, your uh, reading and your learning? Well, I'm, I'm certainly trying to go to uh, the library a little bit more. We've got a great library near us so I can go out and take books um, and begin to get into them and then decide whether or not to purchase for Kindle or hard copy. But actually the step before that to help me understand uh, or make that good decision, like Naval would say, is YouTube. I'll go to YouTube. I'll look for a, a, a really simple breakdown. Maybe it'll be an animated summary. Maybe it'll be a sort of a trailer or an introduction by the author themselves or an interview that they've done to get a sense of what that uh, thought is about what, what have they written? What style or theme are they going for? What value is it creating? And then from there, I'll go out and decide: is this something to pick up and flick through, or is it something to um, go go a little bit deeper and just uh, go and purchase it straight away? That that's that's my go to thing. YouTube because there's so many great, similar to your book summaries that you can find online. Similar in the sense that it delivers some of the key lessons or thoughts and helps me understand them in, in quite a simple way. And, and how, how often are you reading? Tell us about, and what are you reading? Oh, well, I mean, look, I think a lot of the time, Mike, the benefit of pulling together a show for moonshots will be, uh, the inspiration for myself. So if I'm pulling together uh, a show, some key lessons, from Naval Ravikant, what I might do is stumble upon another strain of thought or another mental map or another mental model that's built on maybe some of the work that Naval has done. And what that enables me to do, giving it an angle around moonshots, is to have a reason to go out and do it. You know, if I haven't got the, let's say, the drive or the interest, or maybe even the awareness of a particular individual. The moonshot show, although I might be tooting our own horn here, <laughs> is uh, is actually for me at least the way in for a lot of these authors, entrepreneurs, and thinkers, because it, it's helping me uh, bring them up to the surface and and learn about them. Yeah, out yeah. Well, you know, I um, I, I really do encourage uh, our listeners to try and make reading a daily habit. I, I love the idea of getting book summaries or YouTube summaries. I definitely encourage you to mark up, highlight anything that you read. And then there is a great tool called Readwise, which will pick up all of your highlights and reintroduce you to them 
in the days following the highlight, which is a very good way to really put those learnings deep into your mind. So that's Readwise, which is another tool I, I uh, use. And then you can build like a very good workflow. So everything you absorb um, that you really hand pick is then brought back to you regularly as a thought, quote, as a little idea. And that's how you can really cement the thinking in, into your mind. Mm. But as we talk about thinking and as we kind of re- reflect a little bit on sort of the overall mindset of Naval Ravikant, one thing here is really powerful. And that is that there is a connection between all the different people, Dan Harris, Dalai Lama, Naval Ravikant, the entire series of the happiness series is really connected by this fundamental thought. And that is that happiness is not something we defer until the end of a journey, a project, or even a lifetime, but it's something very, very different. So for the most loyal Moonshots listeners and members who have lasted to the end of the show, I am so delighted to play for you now the most powerful thought of this entire series. Did you make a gradual shift to happiness or was it a radical change? It's ongoing. It's gradual. Every day. So gets you're better. happier today than you were a month ago. Yeah. Allegedly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm very happy these days. Deliriously. So it's actually hard for me to hang out with normal people. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. So you, you've made a significant shift over the period of like how many years? Probably about eight years. Eight years. Yeah. Wow. And is this something that you've pursued through certain books or is it just like you, you've made an understanding or gained an understanding in your own yeah. mind and then started pursuing it based on that understanding? Yeah, it's very, very personal. Uh, it's basically you have to decide it's a priority. Mm-hmm. And then I tried every hack I possibly could. I used to, you know, I tried all the, I tried meditation, I tried witnessing, uh, you know, I even tried an SSRI just to see what it would feel like. How did it feel? Uh, it was, it turned me from a pessimist to an optimist, but I didn't like the physical side effects, nor did I want to be on a drug for a sustained basis. Mm. So I dropped it and I but felt- But it did turn you into an optimist. Yes. At the time I used to be a pessimist. Yeah. Um, I started doing things like I would start looking at the, uh, you know, in every moment and everything that happens, you can look on the bright side of something. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I used to do that forcibly. And then I trained it until it became second nature. So for example, like a friend of my wife's was over and she- when we were dating and she took all these photos, she took like hundreds of photos and then she sends them all to us. And my immediate reaction was like, why are you dumping hundreds of photos on my phone? I don't need hundreds of photos. I have some judgment. That was my immediate reaction. And then I could say, actually, how nice of her. She sent me hundreds of photos. I can pick the one that I like, right? There are two Mm, ways of seeing almost everything. There are a few things that are like high suffering. So you can't do that other than just saying, well, this is a teacher, right? But I slowly worked through every negative judgment that I had until I saw the positive. And now it's second nature to me. I also realized that like what you want is you want a clear mind. So you want to let go of thoughts happy thoughts disappear out of head automatically, very easy to let go of them. Negative thoughts linger. So if you interpret the neg- the positive and everything very quickly, you let it go, right? You let it go much faster. Um, get, simple hacks, get more sunlight, right? Learn to smile more, learn to hug more. These things actually release serotonin in reverse. Mm-hmm. They aren't just outward signals of being happy. They're actually feedback loops to being happy. Um, spend more time in nature. You know, these are obvious. Watch your mind Watch your mind all day long. Watch what it does. Not judge it, not try to control it, but you can meditate 24-7. Meditation is not a sit down, close your eyes activity. Meditation is just basically watching your own thoughts like you would watch anything else in the outside world and say, why am I having that thought? Does that serve me anymore? Is that conditioning from when I was 10 years old? Mm. Like, for example, getting ready for this podcast. You got ready? I didn't. Oh, but good. I did, but I did, <laughs> but I did, but you I couldn't did. help it. And what happened was the few days leading up to this, my mind was just running and normally my mind is pretty calm and it was just running and running and running. And every thought I would have, I would imagine me saying it to you. My brain couldn't help but rehearse what, what it's doing. It's just rehearsing all the time to talk to you. And then I was even rehearsing rehearse telling you about the rehearsal mm. right so it was all playing all these <laughs> meta games and i was just like shut up stop it what is going on and it took me a while to figure out oh yeah you know what it is 
when I was a kid in Queens and I had no money and I had nothing and I needed to save myself, the way I got out was by sounding smart, not being smart, sounding Mm. smart. That was the skill I perfected. So I am hardwired to always rehearse things so I will sound smart. It's a disease. It keeps me from being happy. So, But when you see that, when you realize that, when you understand something, then it naturally calms you down. So after that, I stopped rehearsing as much. Wow. But it's still a train habit. That That is a really interesting point that you want to sound smart, that that many people do that, and especially young people. When you, you, you see someone who is smart or someone who appears smart, they say smart things. Right. You go, God, I want to sound smart. I want people to think about me the same way I think about that person. That, that is my disease. That is my feeling. It is what yeah. clutters my mind. I, I, the, the, the thing I have to ask myself now is if I can... Would I still be interested in learning this thing if I couldn't ever tell anybody about it? Mike, I mean, again, Naval is bringing it home for us on today's show. There's so much that we could dive into there, particularly that closing thought around if I had to internalize it and not talk to anybody, would I still enjoy it? But I think the big thing for me within that clip is the idea that happiness is a choice that we decide how much time and how much work to spend on. Oh yeah. It's like kaboom. All the shows line up against this. So with different flavors and expressions of how you might get there, but in the end, do you choose for happiness? Cause it can kind of means like, it's like saying I want a six pack. That means you got to like cut back on your calorie intake. You got to work out. If you choose for happiness, you got to, you got to cut out on the negative stuff. You got to start on the positive stuff. You got to get super grateful. You got to get super humble. Are you really prepared to do that? And, and that's the big twist here is that everyone we've listened to has made this choice in the series. Haven't they, Mark? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, going all the way back to Dan Harris with 10% Happier, we were learning from him that happiness was not necessarily a kind of secret. There wasn't a secret way to doing it. And it wasn't a destination that all of us are going to instantly or eventually come into. Instead, what every single author, entrepreneur, spiritual leader has said to us without, throughout this series is that it's something you have to work on actively yourself daily building in those practices to notice that blue sky, to notice how you respond and interact with other people. Mm -hmm. Because it is, as Naval said earlier in the clip, there's that compound interest. You do a little bit today and a little bit tomorrow. Gradually over time, you're going to become A, probably more pleasant to be around, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but also be happier in yourself and more satisfied with what it is that you're doing. It's I mean, you know, the, um, the hard thing is, is it really kind of hits you in the guts because you're like the, the, the deliberateness and the intention of you, you got to make that choice. You can, something can happen. You can, as Naval was talking about, you can receive hundreds of photos and say, oh my God, why did they do that? Or you can say, cool, lots to choose from. That moment is the choice, isn't it, Mark? It's not that easy, is it? Look, it's not that easy. And and as we are hearing from Neil Pasricha, who was giving us almost like a playbook into how to think about um, or how to create a manual around these habits, it is something that all of us, I think, along the journey of this happiness series have started to appreciate just how difficult it is. But at the end of the day, Mike, if these VCs, these spiritual leaders, these authors, these uh, anchormen, if all of us can uh, learn something from these individuals, these high functioning, successful people, then I think we're in a pretty good spot to learn from them, to absorb them, to build some new daily habits and just figure out what works for you and I. Exactly. So of all those things that work, which one works the most for you? Well, I'm going to really focus on the reading, actually. I think Mm. starting with uh, what we already do on the show, but really giving it uh, more of an attitude shift, re- maybe utilizing Readwise as you've as you've called out, 
just to compartmentalize and pull out those insights that I learned along the way is going to be really valuable for me. As you look back on the show with Naval, what have you um, particularly taken away from Mike? Uh, definitely taking the the more painful route in the short yes. term, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Got to work on that one. Got to work on that one. <laughs> Well, Mark, listen, thank you to you and thank you to you, our members and listeners. Here we are on show 196 where the work of Eric Johnson, the almanac of Naval Ravikant was studied indeed. And the journey into the work of Naval Ravikant started with understanding how to create wealth. And the key thought was being patient with actions and patient with results. We then on to, went on to look at building skills and expertise. And importantly, we looked at the art of decision-making where if two paths are equally difficult, take the harder path. And if you want to build that happiness, you want to build that wealth, you got to love to read. you got to feed the mind so you can make all those better decisions. And fundamentally what we came to together today on the Moonshots podcast where we learn out loud together is the big choice, not only of this show, but of this series. Happiness is a choice. And what we learned from Naval is that the most important trick To be happy is to realize that happiness is a choice that you can make and a skill that you can develop. You can choose to be happy and then you work on it. It's just like building muscles. Never has the truth been told like that. Uh, That is so very true. And if you make that choice, so many good things can happen. You can learn out loud together. You can be the best version of yourself. And that is exactly what we're here to do on the Moonshots podcast. Okay, that's a wrap.